dici così per loro è... Sì, sì, no, io preferisco l'italiano. Buongiorno a tutti. E, allora, abbiamo eh, qui con noi, eh, qui in sala, Nadia Urbinati e in collegamento, quando, quando riusciremo ad avere il collegamento, eh, Pippa Norris, che sono due, due tra le principali esperte di populismo, diciamo, due autorità nel, nel settore. Io, eh, abbiamo problemi col collegamento o... Ah. Ok. E, allora, io eh, ho conosciuto Nadia, Urbi... allora, le... Nadia Urbinati, politologa, insegna, la conoscete tutti, insegna teoria politica alla Columbia University, ha scritto libri come L'Ethos della democrazia, Democrazia rappresentativa, Democrazia indiretta e la democrazia sfigurata che è un libro che si occupa più specificamente del, del populismo. Pippa Norris ehm, ha scritto un libro eh, voluminoso da poco, molto interessante sul populismo, che si chiama eh, Cultural Blacklash, cioè la, la reazione culturale che avrebbe provocato il, il populismo. Eh, sottotitolo è Il populismo autoritario, cioè un, una particolare specie di populismo ed è una studiosa anglo-americana, insegna ad Harvard e alla Sydney University. Allora io vi volevo introdurre le, le due studiose che, che abbiamo la fortuna di avere con noi oggi. Come vedete ho studiato, quindi posso, non vi dirò tutto perché sennò esaurisco il tempo delle interessantissime cose che ci diranno Nadia. Urbinati e Pipanores. Allora, io Nadia Urbinati l'ho incrociata perché ho scritto un articolo per il Corriere della Sera sulla democrazia diretta quando i 5 Stelle sono andati al governo e hanno per la prima volta nella nostra storia deciso di dare a un ministro il compito di occuparsi di democrazia diretta. La democrazia diretta è un argomento tipico del populismo, sono due cose molto collegate perché la Brexit è stata scelta per referendum, quindi democrazia diretta. Di democrazia diretta hanno eh, parlato sia l'estrema destra tedesca, sia partiti populisti eh, come Podemos e come 5 Stelle in Italia. E eh, Nadia Ombirati ha scritto un libro interessantissimo che si chiama Democrazia indiretta, in cui eh, tutto sommato non ha un approccio tanto negativo, anzi nei confronti della possibilità di una partecipazione alla democrazia in senso diretto. Ehm, la democrazia indiretta non è una democrazia diretta, è una democrazia in cui eh, il popolo può partecipare alle scelte ehm, esprimendo la propria opinione, ad esempio in siti come, come il sito russo della, dei 5 Stelle, anche se diciamo in questi giorni, ieri si sono visti tutti i limiti di, di una scelta come quella del sito Rousseau. Ehm, in, nella democrazia sfigurata invece Nadia Urbinati, eh, correggimi se, se sbaglio, ehm, dice fondamentalmente che la democrazia rappresentativa è, si fonda su una diarchia, una diarchia tra la volontà che è la parte diciamo, decisionale fatta dalle istituzioni, la legislazione e l'applicazione delle leggi e l'opinione pubblica. L'opinione pubblica e 
chiaramente, diciamo, lei lo definisce il foro delle opinioni. Eh, queste due entità che fondano la, la diarchia vanno bene se sono autonome, se interagiscono ma con autonomia. Il populismo insieme con la tecnocrazia e con il plebiscitarismo sono le tre forme di patologia del rapporto tra queste, tra queste due entità e in particolare il populismo ha il difetto di eh, condizionare la volontà, quindi le decisioni del governo, ehm, fondendo la volontà con l'opinione ma solo della maggioranza, quindi si perde la tutela delle minoranze. Venendo a Pippa Norris, vi dico in breve, allora, il suo libro eh, Cultural, Cultural Blacklash è un libro che mh, è molto interessante perché ha un approccio molto poco ideologico al populismo, individua tutti i rischi del populismo chiaramente, ma li analizza con, con, molta, con molto distacco, devo dire, e eh, senza criminalizzare il populismo in quanto tale, e smontando una serie di luoghi comuni. Intanto diciamo, la definizione di populismo che dà Pippa Norris è molto simile a quella di Cas Mode, che è quella più celebre, cioè quella dell'ideologia leggera, cioè un'ideologia che non ha un suo contenuto, ma che ha più che altro una attenzione a chi decide cioè alla, dà al popolo la sua sovranità e alla, non, non bada a che cosa il popolo debba decidere e, um, e si, chiede, si chiede se effettivamente le democrazie stiano morendo sapete che un libro di grande successo è How Democracies Die di di Ziblatt e Levischi, se ne è molto discusso in America, e rispetto a Ziblatt e Levischi eh, Pippa Norris ha un approccio molto molto diverso, cioè eh, Levischi e Ziblatt citano dei dati che sono quelli della, della Freedom House, secondo cui ci sono moltissimi paesi, 89 paesi in cui nel 2017 l'indice di democrazia è stato in calo, pochissimi paesi in cui l'indice di democrazia è stato in crescita, 27, e 51 paesi stabili. Ora, secondo Pippa Norris, invece, ehm, le evidenze portano a, a credere che sia, ci sia, come, come prevedeva Huntington, una, una serie di ondate di democrazia che vanno e che vengono dopo le due guerre, e ehm, eh, più di recente ci sono state delle ondate di democrazia in aumento, indice democratico in aumento. Dopodiché adesso, quello che stiamo avendo adesso è, è un ritorno, un'onda di ritorno, quindi un calo della democraticità che già però si è avuto ad esempio negli anni 30 e ad esempio negli anni 70. Quindi questa cosa ad esempio non va, non va assolutamente drammatizzata. Ecco, io Um, comincerei diciamo, senza, senza andare oltre con, con questa mia premessa, comincerei con una domanda a Nadia Orbinati e poi introduciamo Pippa Norris. Eh, eh, Nadia, secondo te le, la democrazia sta morendo oppure no? Io che domanda. <ride> Who knows? Non lo no, e comunque queste letture molto diciamo catastrofistiche, catastrofiche non, 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 mi, non mi interessano molto perché presumono che ci sia un luogo dove la democrazia deve andare, se non ci arriva allora siamo in crisi, ma noi non sappiamo esattamente dove si possa, è un processo di decisione e di costruzione dell'opinione che eh, ha il rischio all'interno, non, non ha una predefinizione su dove arrivare, ma ce l'ha solo in un senso che vuol riprodurre se stessa, quindi le sue condizioni, eh, uguaglianza di potere politico, distribuzione, eh, elezioni regolari, cioè tutte queste cose mirano a 
ricostruire, riprodurre l'ordine democratico. Questo è l'unico scopo, l'unico veramente grande scopo, che è tantissimo ovviamente, perché significa eh, nel tempo di riuscire a cambiare governi senza mutare il regime, quindi è tanto. Però eh, quando si parla di, di visioni, democrazie che muoiono, che scompaiono, eccetera, a meno che non vengano a mancare le condizioni fondamentali eh, per cui la democrazia può vivere, io non so, non, non so dare questa diagnosi di morte o di agonia, perché se uno fa una diagnosi di agonia o di malattia o di, deve dirmi qual è, qual è, dove dobbiamo pensare di dover andare in relazione, è una visione teleologica, eh, presumo una visione teleologica della democrazia non procedurale pu pura c'è cioè una, una dimensione di bene o di attribuzione alla democrazia di un bene di una superiorità tale per cui se non viene raggiunto è in crisi sì. questo quindi mi, mi mette in dubbio però eh, sono opinioni la democrazia crea opinioni quindi anche su se stessa le crea per cui ci sono in questo momento opinioni molto critiche però re recentemente sono cambiate non voglio mh, dire qualcosa però lo scorso anno ci fu un convegno per esempio a Colombia molto in, in ottobre, eh, che era partito con l'idea di fare un'analisi un delle agonie, varie agonie della democrazia. Poi nel corso della preparazione cambiò di titolo perché si pensava che fosse già un titolo troppo preconfezionato, cioè dire che uno è in agonia vuol dire che si sa quando muore, se no non è in agonia. Quindi cambiarono il titolo e il titolo divenne eh, anxiety, la democrazia eh, ci dà l'ansia, cioè c'è un'ansia democratica, l'ansia rispetto alle sue possibili malattie. Quindi già questo ci dice come dovremmo stare un po' forse attenti a usare questi, queste parole grosse. Certo. Eh, chiediamo adesso a Pippa Norris. Eh, intanto benvenuta e, mh, e lei scrive che effettivamente ci sono dei leader populisti eh, in Venezuela, in Turchia e in Ungheria che hanno eh, toccato i, i, i eh, pesi e contrapesi delle democrazie liberali incidendo anche su diritti fondamentali del cittadino ma che altrove i populisti non sono ancora andati a incidere sulle libertà fondamentali. Eh, lei che cosa dice dello stato di salute della nostra democrazia? So I think that there are three types of regimes and the first is liberal democracies and there what you can see is a fundamental erosion on a number of freedoms. Freedom of the press for example, uh, checks on the executive and also things like social tolerance. That seems to be very evident in response to diversity. So established democracies, particularly of course the United Kingdom right now with Brexit and the United States under Trump, have both seen an erosion of some fundamental freedoms. It doesn't mean to say they cannot recover, but it certainly means that things have, have deteriorated from liberal democracy. There's a second category, and that's the uh, newer democracies, which are often ones which have seen Uh, a more fundamental breakdown. And it's obviously Hungary that had moved towards democracy in joining the EU and has now moved backwards with freedom under Orban. Also the Philippines, for example, under Duterte. Also countries such as Venezuela that were long-standing democracies in, liberal, in, in Latin America but have gone down under Maduro and Chavez. And then we can also see some other cases. So there are important cases of backsliding in many countries if you look at, for example, the variety of democracy indicators, and then there's breakdown in the smaller number of cases. And then finally, the third case, the authoritarian regimes. And I think what's most important here is an author authoritarian resurgence. And that's evidence in China, because, for example, of its aid policies and its economic power, it's evident in Russia. Think about, for example, the way it's destabilized Ukraine in the neighborhood states and interfered and in, uh, intervened in, in Syria under Putin. And then, of course, think about Saudi Arabia, which again has become emboldened. So there are some long-standing authoritarian states which have increased, I think, uh, their role and their power in the world at, at large. So three different situations are going on. Eh, 
Può impostare a tutto schermo così riusciamo a vederla anche da qui, perché in questo momento vediamo la bellissima copertina del suo libro, ma non riusciamo a vedere lei. No, infatti, we, we cannot... Ok, okay. Oh, benissimo. Applauso, applauso dal pubblico. Che fia... Perché la copertina del suo libro è molto bella, però è... lei è decisamente più interessante. Allora, eh, c'era Nadia che voleva farle una domanda. No, no, it's just to understand better, because the audio, the audio was not clear enough. So, uh, authoritarian resurgent authoritarianism as a resurgent authoritarianism and Trump as deterioration, right? I, uh, it's clear. So the two as two different um, phenomena, deterioration of basic uh, constitutional democracies and on the other hand authoritarianism which is more and more a kind of alternative model because until recently Democracy had no alternative model better, but this idea new is a new one. There are authoritarian regimes that they can function in terms of uh, output, they can function better, and not necessarily uh, or worse than our democ democracy. Is this uh, was a, a kind of uh, right summary, correct summary? That's absolutely, that absolutely right. So the international forces, in particular the decline of the United States, has been really dramatic. And under Trump, the retreat from democracy and human rights is really very evident. But it's interesting that it started before the president was elected. In fact, under Obama, America was already retreating from, for example, putting money into international aid and technical assistance to strengthen democracies around the world. And I think you can see that uh, quite evidently being accelerated under Donald Trump because, of course, under Make America Great, it's an isolation, nationalism, withdrawal from international collaboration and uh, a lack of uh, cooperation on things like NATO or the United Nations or other international forum. So essentially what's been happening is that the authoritarian powers around the world have been given a freer reign. They're no longer being sanctioned for a number of different activities, and they feel therefore empowered to reassert themselves. So it's a shift, if you like, in global powers has been going on, and that's very much part of, of the situation. And then the second point you make, Nadia, about the decline of uh, liberal democracies is much more a subtle erosion. And it's not a dramatic change, but it's often much more uh, things going on beneath the surface. It's not that th these regimes have broken down, obviously, by any means. But one looks at things like uh, forms of accountability and transparency in America and the way in which the presidency is really at loggerheads and, and is stagnating with Congress. And you can look at the way that politics have broken down in Brexit. So the major forces, the major powers, particularly Labour, Social Democrat, Christian Democrat, are under tremendous strain. And we can see that, therefore, there are important shifts in stability in the liberal democracies as well. But two different trends, and I think they're complementing each other, and both of those are leading to the reverse wave, as we mentioned, which is we've had before. We had it in the 1920s under the Great Recession. We had it in the 1960s after decolonization. And we're now at another tipping point in which, again, the number of uh, strong um, democracies and liberal democracies in particular are uh, either stable or in clear decline. Sì. Ma, no, sì, sì, no, 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 no. No, volevo solo chiedere una cosa, ma eh, il collegamento tra eh, questa riduzione del, dell'indice democratico e il populismo è un collegamento, cioè è sempre il populismo la causa di, questo, di questa riduzione dell'indice o ci sono anche altre cause? So let's say that it's complicated interaction effects. And we need to make distinctions between two different types of populism. On the one hand, we have what we term authoritarian populism. And this is a populism which really has uh, the features. Populism is all about, as we said earlier, and you've had throughout, throughout the uh, Toronto event, a challenge to the establishment. 
it's saying that we no longer feel that the parties are legitimate or elected politicians or the institutions which are there. For example, the civil service is seen as corrupt. Uh, the media is seen as fake. The judges are seen as partisan. And so there are challenges to established forces. And then, of course, the idea is that the power should go to the, the people, to the ordinary people. Now, is that negative for democracy? Not necessarily. If you live in a corrupt state, if you live in a society where the establishment is not being representative and is not being accountable, then, of course, that's a natural reaction and it can be seen as a positive force for reform. The problem we see, and I, this is my work in my book with Ron Inglehart, is when you link that populist insurgence with authoritarian values. And in that sense, in particular, it's what we mean is a social intolerance. It's a sense that you have to defend your group against other groups, that you're not going to allow minorities to be protected, that you want to be resurgent in nationalism and in, in making sure that your own country is strong at the expense of others. For example, putting up trade barriers is a very clear example, or withdrawing from the European Union so there's no longer cooperation. And above all, with authoritarianism in its classic form, the idea is if your group is under threat, if you're feeling insecure, then you need a strong leader. Because the forms of populism that can allow referendum are very rarely used. Occasionally there are referendum, but they aren't that strong. And so you need a strong leader who's going to defend your group. And that's the aspect. It's authoritarian populism, not populism per se, which is the major challenge, we think, to um, liberal democracy. May I ask a question? Uh, so in the 30s, However, particularly in Europe, but also, well, let's talk about Europe now. Um, yeah. There was not yet democracy. So when the reaction, well, we, we should start after World War I, actually, well before the 30s. Uh, and it was, first of all, a form of populistic reaction against the liberal representative regimes, which opened a little bit uh, uh, the suffrage to the many, but not all, and the political parties right. were not yet organized, to, not yet ready to organize the masses because they were in parliamentary kind of parties, and thus populistic <laughs> movements, in Italy Mussolini was clear, was along with a few mm. others, the organizer of the new emerging masses inside of the state. So mm. in that case, Populism was the moment in which one form of representative regime was becoming another one, from liberal to more democratic. <coughs> and then we knew how the story evolved, and uh, there was a kind of going outside of the regime itself and generating an authoritarian system. Today, we have already strong democracies, 70 years democracy, like in Europe, 70 years old democracy we have, strong uh, mm -hmm. system of division of power, the rule of law. Uh, so we have mm -hmm. mature democracies, not yet in the making like in the past. So what is that makes this populistic um, resurgence a, a, an effective condition or an effective expression of criticism of the form in which democracy is now. That is party democracy with the constitutions and with an autonomous system of uh, public organization of the media and so on and so forth. What is it that makes it so different now and so peculiar? So it's a really important point you make. What I'd like to do is just briefly go to the, uh, I won't go through all these slides, obviously, but I'll go to the core model that we have to explain what's going on today. And here's the two different arguments about why right now populism has really been taking off. The first one goes back to the 1950s. It's classic political sociology, those such as Daniel Bell, Seymour Martin, Lipset, and it's the economic explanation. And this is very familiar, and I'm sure that many of the other speakers in your uh, event have been talking about this. And this explained, it's argued, fascism in Weimar Germany, Pujardism in France, McCarthyism in, in the United States, and potentially, of course, Mussolini and fascism in Italy. And the argument used to be that there was a squeeze 
amongst those social classes. In particular, authoritarianism was seen as a reaction against modernity because on the one hand, in the 1920s, we had the rise of big business, large corporations and, and large factories. And we also had organized labor as trade unions became mobilized, as social democratic parties and labor parties became mobilized. But there was a group in between, the petty bourgeoisie, who were really being squeezed, the small shopkeepers, the self-employed, the entrepreneurs. And it was argued that that was the group that was the potential for support for Hitler, support for Mussolini, and support for other uh, forms of uh, populism and fascism in the 1920s. Now, today, how is that argument updated? Today, the most common argument is, of course, globalization and a reaction against globalization. And in this view, it's the underclass. It's those who have been left out from the knowledge society. It's those who no longer have the skills. It's those who can't find work or at least well-paid work. And those who are dependent on welfare and those who are in poor job security. They might have to go from job to job and they're vulnerable to social risks. Now, if so, then we should find authoritarian populism is evident amongst the economically marginalized, amongst unskilled workers, amongst the less educated. And indeed, there is some evidence that that is found, but it's mostly at the level of community. And I know that you have a number of distinguished economists in the uh, audience and in the group who have discussed that. Now, that's one argument. And what we do is we rather reject that when we look at the evidence. And instead, the way that we explain it, Nadia, is to think about long-term changes in social values. And our story is basically as follows. This is the whole nutshell of the book that the 1960s and the 1970s saw fundamental changes in social values in a more liberal direction. And in particular, it was evident in affluent countries and it was evident amongst the younger generation and the best educated, the college students. And it basically said that progressive values were taking off. It used to be called post-materialist and it can also be seen as socially liberal. There are many different labels. But it's basically an idea that there should be tolerance of, for example, diverse forms of sexuality and gender identities. For example, equality between women and men, new forms of family, respect for LGBT rights, and also secular versus religious, and cosmopolitan versus nationalistic, and support, therefore, for new forms of lifestyle. Now, it used to be a minority, but what's happened, we argue, and this is again the core, is that this group has really expanded its, its size in the population through to demographic change. The baby boomers who hold these values and other groups have expanded. As a result, those who are socially conservative, who do not agree with these values, who think that we should have a national protection versus being part of the European Union, who think we should have marriage versus new forms of sexuality, such as transgendered in individuals in the army, who believes in religion, rather than secularization, all of those groups are under threat. And they've tipped from a majority to a large group in society and still a large group in the electorate, but a group that feels under threat. And they're often in rural areas and they're often older and they're often less educated. And that group that was always the majority, that thought its values were safe, that thought this was mainstream in Italy, in America, in Britain, that group now is feeling insecure at its fundamental values, at the things it believes in. And it's not just they believe that they think that they perceive this or that they told that their values and lifestyles are no longer um, common, but that they actually are under threat. Now, if so, populist values and votes for these parties should be predicted by generation above all, where generation becomes the new class, younger people who vote, college education, a big, big division between those who've gone to college and those who haven't. Urbanization, those who live in urban areas, who live very much in increasingly diverse societies versus those who live in rural communities, um, those who are religious and uh, secular, race and ethnicity and sex. All of those things should be the new cleavages which are dividing parties and politics and society as a whole. And we think this tipping point has occurred and is very evident. And again, I'll just give you a very brief um, 
summary to show you, um, and again, there's lots of lots of divisions here, which I won't go into in, de in depth, but I'll show you the tipping point in values. And it comes here. So on, if you look across the bottom, what you have is cohort of birth, which is the older generation, our grandparents, our parents, and then um, our younger generations. And we have two sets of values. And these values don't mention anything towards parties. They don't say who, which leader do you support. They don't say, how did you vote? They're your basic values on things like, do you believe in authority? Do you want to have security? Do you want to have order? Versus those who say, I want to have freedom. I want to have um, uh, an ability to do, uh, basically to, to pursue my own lifestyle. And those who are libertarian versus authoritarian. And you can see that across all of these countries, which are European, and this pulls 30 different countries, those who are authoritarian has dramatically declined in terms of their size of the population, especially in, in the baby boomers. And we can see amongst young people, it's those who believe in libertarianism and those who therefore will support, um, especially green parties, who have been really very much on the rise. And the tipping point has occurred at different stages in different types of society. And I'll just give you one more and then come back. You can see here a variety of different European countries, and you can see exactly the same pattern in people's values. And so in some countries, we can see the tipping point occurred amongst earlier generations. In others, like Ukraine, where they've gone through a much more insecure society, the tipping point is only just starting to occur. But again, you can see that in every European country, the tipping point has been occurring here, for example, is Italy, and we can see that the older generation in black remains strongly authoritarian, traditional in their values. The younger generation remains libertarian. And that tipping point is where that's what's been catalyzing the rise of new parties. That's what's been catalyzing the rise of new issues. And that's what's been really destabilizing the old system, the left-right division, the division between Christian Democrats and, and Social Democrats, Labour and Conservative is no longer relevant or as relevant. It's not so much about the economy. It's all about the cultural wars which are there between these basic visions of society. Should Italy, should Britain, should, should other countries like France be part of a cosmopolitan and liberal set of values? Or should they reflect the older traditional national values that used to be there and are now increasingly fading? So a tipping point, which is really re reconfigurating politics as we see it. That's the heart of our book. Thank you. Oh, grazie. Ehm, io le voglio dire, allora, ci, eh, come lei sa bene, si è da poco votato qui in Europa e, e ci sono dei dati sui flussi, degli studi sui flussi elettorali che si sono già fatti in questi giorni, che abbiamo pubblicato sui nostri giornali, che sembrano dar ragione al, al nucleo fondamentale del suo libro, questo della, della rivolta culturale, della reazione culturale che ha all'origine del populismo. In particolare, lei parla molto anche di fenomeni di urbanizzazione che sono all'origine di, di questa rivoluzione silenziosa eh, per cui prevalgono poi i valori nuovi, i valori post-materialisti mm -hmm. e mettono a rischio. Eh, ad esempio, nelle città in Italia si è votato per i partiti tradizionali, nel, nelle grandi metropoli italiane ha vinto il PD, che, che è il, il partito tradizionale progressista italiano. La Lega e i 5 Stelle hanno vinto di più nelle province e nelle aree rurali. L'elettorato della Lega, che tra l'altro si ha detto tra parentesi è un partito che enfatizza molto proprio i temi che lei sure. attribuisce al populismo, cioè eh, controllo dell'immigrazione e sicurezza, e che ha un leader forte come Matteo Salvini, che ha avuto un grosso successo in Italia, ehm, in particolare, come le dicevo, la Lega ha come suo elettorato prevalente eh, casalinghe, operai e, e, e elettori con titoli di studio medio-bassi, laddove invece quelli con i titoli di studio medio-alti, per esempio, vanno più su forze italiane right. e su partiti tipo tradizionali. Io le volevo chiedere, ecco, a proposito degli ultimi dati elettorali, mm -hmm. quello che è successo in Italia è una cosa molto strana, molto particolare. Noi avevamo i 5 Stelle che, eh, secondo i suoi parametri, sarebbe un movimento populista di sinistra, diciamo, libertario, no? di quelli che piacciono più ai giovani, no? secondo me, da come li descrive nel suo libro. 
e la Lega che invece è un partito populista di destra, ehm, secondo le, sempre le sue descrizioni perché enfatizza di più la sicurezza e i temi che dicevamo. Allora, la Lega che era il secondo partito ha di gran lunga superato i 5 Stelle, è arrivato al 34%, i 5 Stelle hanno avuto un fortissimo calo. Allora, quello che le volevo chiedere, Yashamuk a proposito di questo fenomeno avvenuto in Italia ha detto che il populismo di sinistra uh -huh. non funziona ed è vero perché se lei vede i dati di Podemos, Podemos è andata male, Siriza è andata uh -huh. male, Tsipras è addirittura costretto right. ad andare alle elezioni. E qual è il motivo per cui funziona di più il populismo di destra rispetto a quello di sinistra? Perché la Lega, diciamo, in base a quello che lei dice del populismo, perché la Lega va meglio dei 5 Stelle? So, both of these, the libertarian populists and the authoritarian populists, they're both originating from a, the same kind of philosophy of populism, which is to say a disgust with the establishment, because the establishment is no longer seen as responsive to the public. They're no longer reflecting their values or, or listening to their interests, or they're corrupt, or they're otherwise uh, uh, not in touch. And, and the difference, of course, is in terms of what broader policies people uh, and parties are trying to advocate, what they're actually pushing forward. And authoritarian uh, populists are the ones who are appealing to this sense of insecurity and this sense of nationalism, and in particular the Lega, the idea that we need to uh, reduce the number of immigrants throughout Europe, and particularly in, in Italy, but also in a broader sense, that we need to have a, a national identity versus a European identity. And those are very traditional values which have always been there, and which they themselves in particular, and many other parties which are very similar, can appeal to in a very strong way. The, I think the, the, the left-wing or the libertarian populists have more difficulties in um, making their case and expressing their values. And uh, as you say, Podemos in particular in Spain, it had achieved some popularity and some success in earlier years, but in the European elections, their particular base was also being challenged, of course, by Green parties, who made um, considerable advances in this particular election, and then by other independents who were also able to basically cannibalize the same policy space, the same pol part of political competition. So the libertarians um, are not alone, essentially. There are many different groups who are vying for their attention. And the way in which climate change and concern about biodiversity and other concerns about the environment have really shot up uh, means that the Greens have a very clear appeal in that policy space, whereas those which are libertarian populists have less clear policies. Uh, and they're also, of course, being rivaled by traditional social democrats on some of their economic policies, for example, on redistribution, welfare and things like that. So in every, in every part of party competition, when it's changing, you need a clear message. And if I can refer to the United Kingdom in particular, what we saw in the European elections was that those parties which had a very clear, very simple message were the ones that managed to really push up their share of the vote. And this was partly the Brexit party, which came first, and their whole message under Nigel Farage is quite simply a no-deal Brexit, just withdraw. But the other party, the fascinating thing, the Liberal Democrats, who had a, uh, a message which was, uh, bollocks to Brexit. They just said, we are Remain, we're the strongest Remain party. And they also pushed up. The poll that was just being done by Lord Ashcroft, published today, says that uh, the Liberal Democrats are currently number one, the top party in terms of public uh, approval. Brexit has slid, slid down a bit, and clearly Labour and the Conservatives have slid, largely because they have no clear policy. Nobody knows what Labour stands for on Brexit, and the Conservatives are so divided, and without a, a clear leader, nobody knows what they really stand for right now as well. So every party, if the party is shifting, and if the cleavages, the basic drivers of party support are in the process of shifting as well, you absolutely need to know where you stand. And vacillation, being in the middle of the road, trying to have a compromise, when parties are polarizing, and when the public is polarizing, is a recipe for disaster. Uh, you have to have a very clear message that you can convey to the public about where you stand on the key issues of, of the day. And, and I think that, that those populists in, in Europe who stood on a clear message, they did relatively well, not as well as um, sometimes some people had expected, but still the national rally in France uh, did quite well. 
and one could see similarly uh, the, the Law and, and Justice Party did quite well, and there were others in Europe as well. Those parties which tried to stand in the middle ground uh, were the ones that lost out, uh, including in Germany and including in um, Sweden and many other countries. Io volevo chiedere a Nadia Orbinati, perché eh, Pippa Norris ha accennato al successo dei Verdi. C'è il movimento legato a Greta Thunberg, c'è una nuova sensibilità ambientale. Siamo di fronte alla nascita di un fenomeno nuovo, diverso da quello del populismo, con questo successo dei Verdi, secondo te Nadia? Io non sono un esperto del, della società e della politica tedesca, qui abbiamo Forfa Merkel, dovremmo chiederlo a lui forse. Ma mi sembra che i Verdi siano un movimento, the green, in, in, uh, they are a strange movement because they are not necessarily a liberal movement. Men, sometimes they can be communitarian, um, connected to a, an austerity vision of life, uh, self-containing uh, uh, consumerism. So this form of pre or anti-modern or anti-consumeristic uh, uh, ethos that uh, in the Greens sometimes we find. How can you make them connected to libertarianism? Mm. Is sometimes they seem to be... Sì, effettivamente critics. ci sono delle similitudini. Uh, sì. Sì. Mm. Se, secondo lei, Pippa Norris, ci sono delle similitudini tra, tra le istanze dei Verdi e quelle dei libertari, cioè dei, dei populisti di sinistra. C'è qualcosa di populista nei, nei Verdi? Faccio un'altra domanda allora. No, I have this actually another question. Connected to yes, what you were uh, is this directed to me? Or to... Yeah, but does it... Yes, it was directed to you. Yes, yes, I mean... Absolutely. If one looks at the philosophy, the values, the things that, that Greens stand for, of course the environment is critical and all of those issues which people are now experiencing. In the United States, for example, we have at the same time wildfires in California and communities being destroyed and floods in the Midwest and record levels of tornadoes which are going on in the Midwest as well. So everybody is understanding the environment is critical although the politicians have been somewhat reticent to put it forward, uh, uh, particularly in the Democratic Party, there's a debate about how important those, those issues can be. But Green parties in Europe in particular are also very much those at the forefront of libertarian values in terms of things like, for example, t uh, social tolerance of minority groups, uh, cosmopolitanism. Greens are very, very much part of the European Union and, and connected throughout the sister parties, and then also issues of uh, sexuality, gender equality, uh, and a variety of other issues like that. So those values go together quite cohesively, and the Greens, as we say, have made progress in the European elections, depending on the country that we, we look at, of course, um, and clearly in Germany, are producing uh, dramatic effects in terms of the party system. Whereas the major parties are, again, as we say, divided internally, Uh, and I think what one can also see is a contagion. So when the Greens go up, so you can see the Social Democrats often take on much more of a concern about environment, just as when the um, authoritarian populists make progress and make uh, gains, so you can see that the mainstream parties also start to talk about, for example, more restrictions on migration and more restrictions on the European Union and a more nationalistic uh, perspective as well. So... You can't just look at the parties. You also have to look at how party competition plays out across Europe. But clearly, the destabilization that's going on, the fragmentation, the polarization is something which is affecting all of the major parties right now. And the Greens are benefiting as the populists benefited in the European elections. I'd like to ask you a question concerning also in relation to the Lega no, the, Italian, the Italian case. Five stars, Lega. But it's not only five stars, Lega, it's more general. You, you don't pay much attention, so it seems to me, for this reason, I'm uh, pushing you to these, toward these uh, issues. The issue of party and party forms, political party. Yes. The Lega is a structured, traditional political party with an organization on the territory 
uh, in a very scrupulous way, almost traditional party, with a populistic leader, plebiscitary leader, we using all the new media in, to, in order to create his own popularity, his own plebiscitary leadership, but the party remains there as an organization. Mm -hmm. The other parties we mentioned, and which are into a crisis, Podemos, Five Stars Movements, even Melanchon, um, they are kind of digital party, or party uh, that the digital aspect was so crucial in creating them. And they are all in a crisis now, as if uh, they wanted to be against party, against party democracy in order to create a different democracy, and now, with their own decline, with their own defeat, they show perhaps uh, that without an organized party, democracy is difficult to manage. So what do you, Yes, that's right. What do you, what do you say about party and new digital media or new ways of communication which seems to give us a different democracy without parties but at the end when they are in government or they are very close to being in government they really need to become organized parties. So I think it's a little early to say that Podemos or Five Star or any others has, has had a big decline. Clearly, what happens with many new parties is that they're very volatile, that they can be protest parties. And what matters above all is how far you can mobilize your base, how far you can mobilize voters, how far you can really catch the energy. Uh, and so that dynamism is something which is there. If you have a party organization, a traditional party organization, what that tends to do is take you over good times and bad. In other words, you have grassroots members, you have party loyalists, you have an organized structure, you have funding, which is also based on, on that sort of format. And so it's e easier to, wait, uh, to ride out a particular election defeat. If, however, uh, you're much more of what we used to term a flash party, a party which can go up, but can easily go down, and we can think of a number of cases like that in, for example, the Netherlands. Um, we can see, think about parties which are populist and which suddenly shot up in the polls. Um, Pim Fortuyn was a classic example. But then when you lose a leader or you have an election defeat or there's some form of corruption, you go back down again. So what party organization, the traditional form, does is it stabilizes. It creates a party uh, which is going to outlast a particular leader or outlast a particular election result. So we can see that uh, a flash party can be very successful. And again, think about the Brexit party in Britain. Nigel Farage founded it 30 days before the actual election. And he came first as a party, which was a remarkable, as everybody flowed from the people who'd been voting for UKIP, and they, they flowed over to the Brexit party. Whether or not that can be repeated I think is the enormous question which is facing um, Britain right now and is facing the Conservative Party as well as facing the Brexit Party and the Labour Party. Nobody knows exactly how to respond because there isn't a party in the sense of party members who've joined Brexit. There isn't uh, uh, representatives at different levels. There's no Brexit Party in local government. There's no base, if you like, and there's no internal democracy. In fact, there aren't actually that many policies other than the fact that they are against um, being part of the European Union. So they're vulnerable should the agenda change or should, for example, the Conservatives pick up those issues and run with it very successfully under a, a new leader, whoever that will be. Uh, so smaller parties and parties who have less track record um, are essentially parties that can succeed but they can also fail very dramatically as well. Um, uh, and we'll have to see how all of these parties develop in the next uh, few years before we can say whether or not they've really got stability in how they can compete. Volevo, a proposito di digitale, secondo, mh, ho solo ultime due domande, poi se c'è qualche domanda dal pubblico eh, cominciate a prepararvela. E, mh, una a proposito del digitale, allora, secondo Yasha Munk il digitale ha un ruolo importante nell'ascesa del populismo, mm. ad esempio, lui fa l'esempio, Trump, se, se ci fossero stati i media tradizionali, i, e questo è molto vero, lo posso dire, diciamo, lavorando in un giornale, i media tradizionali non avrebbero dato spazio a delle frasi così forti, così violente, anche xenofobe, 
dette da Trump perché c'è sempre stato un pudore da parte dei media tradizionali rispetto a dar spazio a cose politicamente molto scorrette. Il fatto che esistano i social network ha fatto sì che i giornali fossero costretti a dar spazio a Trump perché se, Trump, se non, se non l'avessero fatto Trump avrebbe comunque raggiunto il, il, i cittadini americani attraverso i social network. Quindi la disintermediazione ha avuto un ruolo fondamentale. Secondo lei eh, i social network e la rivoluzione digitale in atto mm -hmm. ha, hanno un collegamento con l'ascesa del populismo o no? So here I, I'd argue that essentially social media is brand new. It's after all we have had the internet since 1994 and emails and a variety of other mechanisms to expand technological communication have been around again for the last 20 years. So there's a disconnect between the rise of the internet and then the new forms of, of populism that we're observing. But what we can see is that essentially it facilitates. It facilitates a fragmentation of the media landscape so that no longer do people get their news from the legacy media, the New York Times, the Washington Post, etc., and they're getting the news from a variety of other sources. And what that tends to do is create the echo chamber. And the echo chamber is really important because it really says that if you're in a group and you feel that you're threatened, you can listen to other views, conspiratorial thinking in particular, which is really common on the internet and through social media, where people come to believe things which are really totally against, for example, science or other forms of knowledge. The best example of that right now is what's going on with the anti-vaxxers, those who don't believe in vaccination. All of those messages are being spread through Facebook and through Twitter and through all of those other social media that we can see. So any insurgent movement can take advantage of the social media landscape. And in my earlier work, I've said, for example, the Greens were the masters out of all parties. They were the most digital. They had to do that because they were small parties, they had their message, and they were closely connected through uh, digital media at the time. And we can see that insurgents who are populist can also take advantage. And when they do so, and they, they hit certain chords, then, as you say, the legacy media amplify their message. And sometimes the legacy media think that they can overcome it by having fact checkers by having uh, records to show that many of the things which are being, many of the claims which are being made by politicians are not true. And recently the Washington Post uh, managed to count, I think it was 10,000 cases where Trump had come out with this a statement on Twitter or on uh, other formats, uh, often on, on, on television and radio and so on, which was untrue. The problem is that the legacy media has been shrinking as a proportion of those who get their news on a regular basis from the legacy media. And when they amplify, when, when they cover things like fake news and they say that these messages are ones which have no basis in fact, what they tend to do is they amplify it rather than uh, dampening it down. Because people hear their message not from Facebook per se, but from the way that the legacy media have have covered these sorts of these sorts of things. So social media are really good for small parties, for populists who are trying to expand their support and for any other uh, populist movement, which is also trying to get uh, people to follow its messages. And because people are now very much in bubbles, they will take that um, as, as basically as important as the legacy media message as well. So yes, it's part of their success. Uh, it predated them, but it's very much part of how they managed to achieve a takeoff, if you like, and get credibility in, in what they're saying. C'è qualche domanda, prego. Qui davanti, una e due e tre. Se, se venite al microfono così vi sente. Ah no, ecco, ecco, arriva il microfono da voi. Grazie. Eh, lei non pensa che la diffusione dei populismi attuale sia sì, l'incidenza dei media sia fortemente legata a un abbassamento del livello culturale delle masse che si è registrata negli ultimi anni e quindi per combattere il populismo e per difendere la democrazia penso che sia necessario diffondere le conoscenze a 360 gradi le conoscenze di massa e quindi valorizzare molto la scuola pubblica, l'università pubblica che eh, rimangono un po' marginali rispetto a, a certe università e scuole eh, private 
e, e, e per questa, diciamo, per questo lassismo, questa promozione per una scuola promozionale e poco formativa e così anche per una università diciamo, di massa che è, è solo perché è di massa mh, è vista, debba eh, essere scadente, invece bisogna che sia tutto il contrario, che proprio la scuola di massa e l'università di massa siano più, ehm, debbano essere più qualificate e non promozionali e basta. Grazie. Grazie a lei. Thank you. So, obviously, one solution to populism is about the long-term trends and education. The education gap is absolutely enormous and it's there in nearly all the indicators we have of voting behavior. So those who've gone to college tend to be much more liberal in all sorts of values. They always have. And those who have less edu education tend to be more traditional or authoritarian. The similarly is about age and generational gaps. Similarly, it's about changes in the family and changes between women and men. The problem is the long-term solution is that it's a long-term pattern. And in the short term, uh, politics is being disruptive, social tolerance is declining, and there are real tensions in the stability of liberal democracies. So it's not a short-term solution. And there I think we might want to look at other ways to counter the effects of populism, whether there are changes in policy, for example, changes in migration policy or changes in economic policy, or whether there are changes in how the, the mainstream parties respond to populists, um, or how we can try and, as a society, strengthen democracy through participation and through uh, greater turnout and through a variety of other mechanisms like that. So as a long-term solution, education is important. As a short-term, well, it's not going to change things overnight by any, by any stretch of the imagination. Wolfgang Merkel, Humboldt University, Berlin. Hi, Pippa. My question goes to <laughs> Pippa Hi, and, uh, and Nadia. Should we not stop from an analytical point of view to talk about populism without an adjective? Should we not uh, distinguish uh, clearly between right-wing populism and left-wing populism. The uh, background of this question is, what is problematic for democracy? Are there right contents like nativism, chauvinism, nationalism, discrimination of minority, which is problematic for democracy? Or is it the style, uh, the political style? And if it comes to the political style, Uh, why not to criticize the elites? Whom should we criticize? Certainly not the precariato. Uh, therefore, it is, according to my point of view, if we look to democracy, quite important to distinguish between right-wing populism and left-wing populism. And populism as a thin-centered ideology doesn't tell us so much. I agree, absolutely, 100%. The only thing I disagree is I have abandoned the use of the term right wing and left wing in terms of populism, because I'm not sure that it really actually captures a lot of what we're trying to, to understand about the nature of this phenomena. Right wing and left wing for me, I regard as much more about economics. And we can see that populists are divided about economics, uh, even within the, the as an individual. I think again about Donald Trump. He favors on the one hand tax cuts for corporate business, which is a classic right-wing position. He favors tariffs in terms of uh, economic trade, which is very much a left-wing economic position. So I think we've always been using the term radical right and extreme right and alt-right and a variety of things like that. And I think we need to abandon that. And so the concepts, which I think are much more powerful and much more capturing what we're, we're talking about, are populists who are libertarian, like Podemos, like Five Star, and those who are authoritarian, going right back to the, the classic arguments of the 1950s, which really understood authoritarianism, um, and which we've forgotten about, I think, in the social sciences in more recent years. So an authoritarian personality was what we always used to talk about. Nowadays, if we can talk about both authoritarian values, and they're the values of things like security and order, and authoritarian practices, and they're things like uh, really having... Um, Uh, uh, issues about rule of law and, and, and 
prioritizing security over independence of the judiciary, and then authoritarian states. I think that's a more powerful way to understand what's going on. Now, is populism dangerous by itself? Not necessarily. I totally agree with you. Uh, sometimes it's just an, a form of rhetoric. It's a form of speech. The danger, however, for me is this, Wolfgang, that populism in its strongest claims by delegitimizing the established sources of representative democracy opens the door to authoritarian leaders. So when those two things get together, essentially, I'm critical of elites as well, as are you. Those who are corrupt should be kicked out of power. Politicians who aren't rep representative, who aren't inclusive, uh, are a failure of liberal democracy. But if you throw the baby out with the bathwater, if you throw parliament and the media and checks on the executive and the independent judiciary and the civil service, if you throw all of those institutions out and you delegitimize them, which is essentially what some populist rhetoric does, then you say, well, what else do we have? If none of those institutions are working, if I can't trust Congress, if the president is somebody who I, who I have no faith in, then you turn to the authoritarian leader and you justify authoritarian values. So it's that conjunction which I think is the most powerful, not populism per se. And I agree with you, it's a thin ideology, as Kasmud says, or a rhetoric. It's a form of speech. But by the way, that also says it's not just about a populist party, because every politician can adopt populist um, rhetoric, and they do. Think about all of those, those representatives who ran for the European Parliament, by saying we're critical of, of the European Parliament. And the same is true um, in many other cases. And, and again, if I was to refer to, to the British case, I'd argue that Theresa May was populist, just as Boris Johnson is, just as are many of those who are Eurosceptic in the Conservative Party. It's not simply Farage or UKIP by any mechanisms. And I'd also argue that Corbyn is populist in many regard, in the way that he speaks in some of the claims which he makes. So populism is everywhere. What matters is the values which are tied to populism. And we always need that adjective, therefore, to know what they actually stand for, what their core beliefs are, and what policies they're going to follow. Capire eh, se, eh, a sua opinione, esiste un legame tra legalità e populismo, e in caso se questo fenomeno è diverso nel populismo di destra o di sinistra, mm. ed eventualmente se ha una qualche incidenza nella sua diciamo, degradazione autoritaria. Mm. Yes, I think again, where we, we talk about fake judges, where we talk about partisan judges, where we challenge the rule of law as being the primary principle which every single politician and every elected representative has to work within, when we believe that the president has certain powers which are really uh, very, very corrupt practices, that's where the rule of law starts to weaken. And in America, I think it's really under threat. And it's really quite surprising in a way. We always thought that America was a country that was governed by laws, where the law was really critical and where people had great respect for the courts, uh, even though they had less faith in Congress. But what we find now, of course, is that through the appointments which the Republicans have been making, which are purely on the basis of ideology and partisanship, and the way in which the number of appointments have been made, particularly in the Supreme Court, is that the critical issues in the United States politics are now being decided by the Supreme Court, not by the legislature and not by even the president, for that matter. So issues like abortion, which are dividing politics so deeply in America, are going to be decided. All of these states which have been passing new restrictions on reproductive rights, that's going to have to come to the Supreme Court. But the Supreme Court is not elected, it's appointed. And in particular, the Republicans in the Senate have said the next appointment in the Supreme Court is again going to be one which they'll pass through if it's a Republican, but they'll block um, attempts by the Democrats to also have similar appointments. And I think that's extremely dangerous. It's going to mean that respect for rule of law and the independence and impartiality of the courts is really fundamentally undermined. And if you can't trust Congress and you can't trust the president and you can't trust the courts, then that really allows authoritarian practices to take off. 
uh, and undermines the basic uh, liberal dem democratic principles that we should be running by. And it undermines the constitution as well, uh, which is really very important. Ehm, volevo fare un'ultima domanda e poi eh, lasciarla alle conclusioni. Eh, L'unica cosa che bisogna vedere come si combina è il concetto di autoritario con il fatto che comunque parliamo di leader come ad esempio Trump che sono stati eletti democraticamente e che non hanno modificato il sistema mm -hmm. elettorale per cui mm -hmm. potrebbero essere anche rieletti democraticamente. Grazie. Mm -hmm. So here what we need to think about is the quality of the elections and what's going on. And of course, in the case of President Trump, he was not succeeding through the popular vote, where Hillary Clinton, as we know, won three million more votes. He was elected through the Electoral College. And the Electoral College was always designed traditionally from the Constitution onwards to overrepresent rural states, those states who had a smaller population but who needed representation underestimate the more populous states, the Californias, the New Yorks of the world. As a result, there are real uh, disparities and imbalances in what's going on. So as soon as the difference between rural and urban areas becomes critical, which it really did in the last election, that means that these, these old forms of rules, the Electoral College, uh, have a, a different type of partisan effect. In addition, in, in many countries, what we see is problems of gerrymandering, particularly where you have a system of majoritarian elections, and that's got worse. Gerrymandering is where there's partisan boundaries being drawn, such that they're going to benefit one party versus another. And again, the benefits have been primarily to the Republicans in America, not to the Democrats, although both sides have been responsible for gerrymandering in the past. And then there are other issues, particularly voter suppression and new laws which have been passed, for example, on voter ID, which are making sure there should be security at the polls. People who vote should clearly have citizens' rights and there should be some form of verification. But where those laws have been discriminating, again, against, for example, African-Americans or older voters or poorer voters who might not have a state ID or those who are um, transients, then that's a problem. And then you add in, in America in particular, the many of those who have uh, a prison record and who have then lost their citizenship rights. And you can see that the election itself is something which is contested, and increasingly um, it suffers from problems of electoral malpractice. And this is shown also by the American public. Um, ten years ago, when people were asked, are American elections honest? About 50% said yes. That's gone down to 30% today, as people have seen what happened in Florida, and they've seen the allegations of fraud, in 2016, and then they've seen all of these other debates where the rules of the game, how you get elected, become partisan, and the two parties can't agree on how that should system should work. And you can see it's spread from the United States to many other countries as well. Again, in Britain, for example, European citizens, thousands of them, were not allowed to vote in the European elections. Now, that was partly incompetence, um, and a short, uh, short period of planning for the election. But nevertheless, you can also see how that is, again, a problem that delegitimizes the public's faith in the election itself. And then, if the politicians don't agree either, it's rather like the, um, the umpire in any sport. Um, there should always be contestation about policies, about economic policies, social policies, foreign policies. That's what you might term the normal give and take of any democratic system. If you can't agree on the rules which get you into that elected position, if you can't agree on the role of the courts, if you can't agree on the powers of the executive against the legislature, if you can't agree on how to overcome deadlock, that is how democracy erodes. That's how democracy backslides. That's how we see these fundamental problems. And it's rather like um, a, a, a acid that corrodes the public's faith. They no longer vote, or if they do vote, they vote for joke candidates we've seen in Ukraine, or they vote for protests. They don't vote necessarily based on public policy debates on the key issues of our time. And again, that leads to instability, 
Um, now, that paints rather a dark picture. Does it mean that you can't reform the elections? Of course you can. Italy itself has gone through a number of different reforms over the years. So have many other countries that they've tried to really improve the system. But there's two problems about elections which are still very resistant to any sort of reform. One is money, money in politics, campaign funding, and where elections have become more expensive uh, and where there have been real problems of integrity in how money is being filtered into politics, that's been a fundamental issue which has allowed, again, uh, populists to make uh, considerable gains. Think about Brazil and Bolsonaro and the corruption in Brazil. Think about problems of money and politics in India. Think about problems of money and politics in many parts of the world where there's been a scandal. And, of course, the other problem in, in campaigning has been campaign media. We've been very reluctant to make sure that there's a level playing field, that everybody has access to um, campaigns and to elections. And again, the role of money reinforces that through private advertising. So those who have money through whatever means can really amplify their message. And those who don't have money are really excluded from the, the campaign itself. So is it the case that elections um, are functioning in the same way as they were, say, 20 years ago or 30 years ago? Unfortunately not, as people have learned to manipulate the rules. And that's particularly the case, of course, in, in countries uh, which have gone through elections but have still got uh, very fragile institutions, countries like Russia, uh, countries like Malaysia. So um, I think elections have changed in the way that they work and they facilitate uh, instability in general. And authoritarian populists have taken advantage of that process um, to gain support. La ringrazio tantissimo, ringrazio Pippa Norris, ringrazio Ali Orbinati, ringrazio tutti voi per essere stati qui in un orario difficile post-prandiale e buona giornata a tutti. Thank you.